questions, type them into there. Well, you'll also receive an email recording of this uh, webinar and CLE after the the after we conclude. And note that you'll receive in that email also the course ID, which we'll be saying at the end if you want to get it approved for CLE credit in Florida. So. The agenda of what we're going to do today is we're going to review the ethics rules related to technology. There's quite a few related to competency, related to confidentiality, etc. Um, and then in addition, we're going to talk about different due diligence, uh, things that you can do in considering what tools to use. So what technology tools are you going to use from either vendors or how do you protect yourself in using technology at your firm? And then we'll go over some different questions uh, that you can ask cloud service providers specifically Specifically. And we'll finalize this webinar in the CLE with how the latest law firms uh, use technology and, and why, why you should you use technology and how can you be, again, um, competent in using it. So we'll finalize that again with a Q&A, we'll wrap up and we'll have some time to answer questions as well. So let's get into the technology ethics rules. Again, there's quite a few. So we're gonna be going over a couple different ones. You'll see here that I've outlined both the ABA model rules and then the Florida rules specifically. A lot of them uh, are very similar, but there are some differences. So it's important to know those. And also, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but in that email that you'll be receiving, you'll get a copy of these slides as well. So that way you can go through and if you wanna review any of this information, you'll have it handy. We're going to start with the rule of model uh, model rule 1.1 comment H that was added in 2012 uh, by the ABA who, you know, they had a committee, the 2020 committee um, on ethics and they realized that due to this change in technology, the technology, the technological world was changing, people were communicating in different fashion. So they decided to include this additional language related to competence. So now no longer is an attorney, a lawyer required to just stay abreast of the changes in their law and practice, but it also includes the benefits and risks associated with relevant technology. So now it's no longer okay to just say, oh, you know, that's someone else's job. If you're using technology, which high, it's highly, highly likely that you are in some form or fashion, you need to stay um, abreast of those benefits and risks. Um, and today, 35 different states so far have adopted this into their rules um, specifically in some form or fashion. So Florida, we all know, has adopted these and they have even gone so far to require CLE credit, um, three CLE credits for technology competency. So that um, is, is a great change that you'll see uh, Florida among the others recognizing that this is an important, um, this is important for attorneys to understand. And we wanna talk a little bit about what that means specifically in Florida as well, because the Florida Rule 1.1 is a little bit different. They added some uh, different comments there that you can see within this slide. So not only did they say that you need to uh, know the including the risks and benefits, but also they included a little bit unique language there. They said um, an attorney must engage uh, or stay abreast of the changes in law and practice, engage in continuing study and education, including an understanding of the risks and benefits, uh, the benefits and risks associated with the use of technology. So just making sure, again, that you understand what you're using. And if you don't understand this comment, uh, the next comment that, that Florida added specifically, it's particularly interesting. It says that um, in some instances, it may also involve the association or retention of a non-lawyer advisor of established technological competence in the field in question. So that's quite interesting. Now, really what that means is that let's say you don't understand a technological tool that you're using. This may now uh, increase your responsibilities as an attorney and require you, or um, at least maybe you should consider it to hire or retain or associate yourself with some legal or some technology expert with that particular technology. And in addition, they mentioned that this could also involve safeguarding confidential information related to the representation, um, specifically, for example, electronic transmissions and communication. So things like the emails that you're sending to clients, you may have, again, that increased um, responsibility there. 
So they also updated in 2012, along with the changes to 1.1, 1 .1, uh, model rule 1.6, which as we know, relates to confidentiality. And confidentiality also has to do with some non um, ethical rules, some, some rules related to attorney client privilege, work product, et cetera. But within the model rules itself, they added comment C. So we can see here that comment C says that a lawyer shall make reasonable efforts to prevent inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure or unauthorized access to information relating to the representation of a client. So essentially, you have this duty to prevent reasonable disclosure. So, or, uh, to, uh, excuse me, to, to uh, use reasonable efforts in preventing that disclosure. And interestingly enough, in comment 18 within 1.6, they also said that they clarified kind of who is responsible for prevent or for using these reasonable efforts. So you want to make sure that you get unauthorized access to third parties. So for instance, like opposing counsel, you don't want them to see your metadata, maybe um, thing, things like that, the judge, etc. Um, and then inadvertent and unauthorized disclosure by the lawyer. So again, this is a responsibility specifically related to yourself as an attorney that's practicing. But not only that, it goes further to say that this a uh, duty to use reasonable efforts also extends on to other people who are within your uh, subject, who are within your supervision and participating in the representation of the client. We'll see this uh, further laid out in rules 5.1 and 5.3 that talk about supervision, and we'll get into those in a bit. But just kind of note that as you're going through all these different steps and making sure that you're technologically competent, you want to make sure that your staff and uh, outside experts that you hire also understand this duty and abide by it. Um, in addition, the, just to like reiterate comment, uh, model rule 1.6 in comment 18, um, they specifically mentioned that something interesting to understand is that that reasonable efforts uh, duty is, is reasonable, right? It doesn't mean that if you have this unauthorized or inadvertent disclosure um, or access by a third party and, and it occurs, but you made reasonable efforts, then you don't have a violation of that duty. But we need to consider what is a reasonable effort in preventing this disclosure. So specifically, um, the ABA laid out a couple different factors that you can use as a fact-based analysis in de uh, determining if you've uh, maybe if you've had this, if you've had this met the standard of reasonable efforts. So these are again some factors to consider. It's not. Um, it, it's not. These are again our factors. These are things to consider, but they're not laid down um, as this is the, the, the test. There might be other things you want to consider as well. But in general, to outline some of these bullet points, first of all, the sensitivity of the information. So that's particularly interesting with regard to different practice areas and what type of information you're communicating, right? So maybe you are an attorney who works in healthcare. You have a lot of confidential information that you're probably taking from your clients. So that may increase your sensitivity of information. Also things like mergers and acquisitions, um, something that may in increase um, the highly sensitive information that you're communicating with. And they also uh, included the likelihood that disclosure or likelihood of disclosure if additional safeguards are not employed. This is interestingly enough, I find this more and more that this is a factor that many firms and attorneys kind of uh, put aside. They brush aside thinking that, you know, we're a smaller firm or no one's looking at us. But in today's technological age, with more and more, uh, you know, bad actors, uh, people looking to hack and can hack at a larger scale, I think that nobody is protected, right? That's something that we've seen over and over. I think Matt will kind of reiterate that too in the press um, with our new era of data breaches. Nobody is exactly safe. So you do need to think about that. And I think that likelihood of disclosure is getting probably higher and higher. In addition, we should consider the cost of employing safeguards. This is something interestingly enough that actually may be going down, right? So as technology is more uh, prominent and readily used, I, um, the cost of employing tech, uh, the cost of implementing the safeguards is usually going down. So for instance, when you purchase a laptop, 
it might, you might already have that encryption available within it. So all you have to do is literally with a click of a button, set it up. That's at no cost to you. In addition, we have a lot of su subscription services that are making it, they're not hosting your data um, specifically on uh, you know, your, your hardware. So it's making it a lot easier and, and less costly for you to use those services. And then you need to consider the difficulty of implementing those safeguards, as well as the extent to which if you implement the safeguards, they may adversely affect the lawyer's ability to represent the client. So specifically within that, you may have, let's say that you, you impose these really strict uh, communication encryption measures, but your client doesn't have access um, to, to email, that may be a big factor to consider. And really what type of technology you're using, you don't wanna make it too difficult, but you do want to balance it if it's necessary. And Florida Rule 1.6 is essentially the same. I'm not going to read it over, but again, these slides will be given to you so you can review any of these rules if you want to. It's just important to note that this is the same type of rule that's implemented in Florida as well. And we said that earlier, we mentioned kind of the responsibility of attorneys and lawyers being required um, to not only abide by these ethical rules themselves, but also how do they affect the people that you work with and the outside experts, um, as well as your lawyers and, and staff. So there are responsibilities there as well. Model Rule 1.1 or 5.1 actually discusses the uh, responsibilities of supervising attorneys over the lawyers at their firm. And I'm not going to go over that rule specifically, but note that that is also one that uh, to, to think about when abiding by your professional obligations. But in addition, Model Rule 5.3 talks specifically about the responsibilities of partners and lawyers, as well as anyone supervising other non-lawyers um, regarding non-lawyer assistance. So if you have, let's say, a paralegal, a legal assistant uh, working on a matter with a client, you want to make sure that they perform the, the, they perform the same or they perform in the reasonable, to provide reasonable assurance that the person's conduct, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, is compatible with the professional obligations of the lawyer. So what does that mean, compatible? That means that you should put in this kind of effort to make sure that they understand, first of all, your professional obligations and oversee some of their actions to make, make sure it's compatible. Um, and then again, this rule goes even further. So not just talking about non-lawyer assistance within your office that you've either retained or maybe um, as a consultant, but talking about outside the firm. So that's a very interesting comment that was added, uh, comment three, that talks about that if, uh, so first of all, a non-lawyer specifically says that they can use out, uh, non-lawyers outside the firm to assist the lawyer in rendering legal services to the client. So this can include internet providers, maybe uh, printing and copying uh, printing and copying companies. It's just, it's a, a broad range of experts that you may use outside the firm to represent the client. So that's good to know that first of all, you can use those, but when using them, you have this obligation and this requirement to make sure um, that the services are provided by that outside um, non-lawyer in a manner that's compatible with the lawyer's professional obligations. So understanding how to make sure that, you know, they're performing this in a manner that's compatible just depends depends on the actual, um, depends on the actual who the outside provider is. And then the ABA listed a number of factors to consider here as well. And I think these are important to think about. So the education and experience and reputation of the non-lawyer. It's always good to do reviews. We'll talk about and references. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, in addition, you should think about the nature of the services involved. Is it highly confidential information? Or is it just, you know, a thank you email you need to send out to people? So if it's something that's, that requires a much uh, higher higher level of security, maybe you have a higher standard there. Um, and then the terms of the agreements concerning the protection of client information, this is particularly interesting with regard to um, using outside experts, um, specifically within technology. So if you use a technology um, service provider and maybe uh, to outsource them, so maybe they don't provide clear terms of uh, you know, how they're going to safeguard this information, that can be particularly um, uh, risky and you want to make sure that you probably have a higher uh, 
higher bar in making sure that you're that you're ensuring that they're performing this in a matter that again is compatible with your professional obligations this outside service provider may not know your professional obligations and it's your responsibility to ensure that and then also considering the legal and ethical environments of the jurisdiction in which the services will be performed particularly with regard to confidentiality so you know each jurisdiction may have its own different rules outside the model rules as well uh, that that, that uh, oversee an attorney's responsibility in regards to um, in regards to making sure that they safeguard confidential information, etc. So Florida rule um, also has this rule 5.5 as well as 5.1, which relates to these third parties um, that that you oversee. So. Again, just consider this rule in terms of understanding your obligations as an attorney and overseeing communication uh, with third parties. We want to make sure that, first of all, uh, when we're communicating with clients, we are overseeing and making sure that uh, anyone that we are supervising is performing this in a matter that's compatible uh, with our professional obligations as well. And the Florida Bar actually released an ethics opinion in 2013, ethics opinion 12.3, that specifically uh, mentioned that the use of cloud computing in particular um, is is okay so you have that idea that you know this is being used more and more and more and more firms are using cloud computing but they lay down some additional things to consider when when evaluating cloud service providers. So first of all, they need to take reasonable precautions to ensure that the confidentiality of client information is maintained. So uh, making sure, again, reasonable precautions are taken. And then that the service provider maintains adequate security. We'll go over these again in a couple examples. And that the lawyer has adequate access to information that's stored remotely. Again, we'll talk about access to information and how you can ensure that in just a bit, but note that these are some of the things that your state specifically has outlined. And the lawyer should also research the service provider to be used. So we'll talk about all of this in a bit. But again, this is going, you, you can review these slides in that email that we'll send after. But this is specific law, uh, not law, but an ethics opinion that was issued uh, from your state specifically. And the ABA um, in 2017, interestingly enough, they made some updates um, to, their, to their past ethics opinion uh, in 1999, where they, they talked about um, encryption specifically and that lawyers may have a higher standard in some situations to, to take uh, special security precautions uh, to protect the inadvertent and unauthorized disclosure of client information when either it's required by a client agreement, so a client requires the attorney to take those higher standards or those special security precautions, or maybe by the nature of the information that requires a higher degree of security. So in general, I think um, in 1999, it was a little bit more, you know, there was a reasonable expectation of privacy in email communication, right? That's what, that's what the ABA kind of held from that ethics opinion. And I think we've seen now with the, the era of data breaches and, and hackers and all these things that are going on, we've seen how, how there might not actually be in some instances that reasonable expectation of privacy when you're sending an email to a client. And these are some considerations, uh, things to consider. And in particular, let's say you're, you are an employment law firm and you're representing a um, you're representing a employee who is thinking about suing their company and maybe they are still at their company. You do not want to use their company email to send them information about their potential suit, right? So that is something like, for example, that may require some special security precautions. Again, this is not necessary um, outwardly, but there, it may be something to consider when there are situations such as those. And the ABA outlined some additional considerations to think about when you're uh, considering that. We outlined, again, um, those, those things like the nature um, of the threat, understanding how the confidential information is being transmitted and where it's stored. We'll talk about that also in a bit. Um, using reasonable electronic security measures like passwords, et cetera. So those are all things that are really important. And finally, making sure that you conduct due diligence on vendors providing this communication technology. So um, we will talk about kind of a way to assess uh, multiple different factors that are listed out here in just a second. So I want to note though, 
final uh, finalizing and in a review of the of the law that that applies to technology competence a uh, rule 1.4 which specifically relates to communication how you communicate with a client and as we've seen um, this has kind of changed over time right our our ideas of how we can communicate um, have have changed and clients almost expect you to have some sort of email or some sort of encryption and all of that so in general when you consult with a client you need to consult with them about the means by which the client's objectives are be going to be accomplished and that updated ABA rule they actually mentioned that if the attorney is going to use these higher security precautions they may actually have a duty to communicate those with the client themselves so letting them know what you are going to be using as well as have the duty to if the client doesn't agree with those or if the client thinks that that may not work for them to work with them around that it doesn't necessarily require you to use what the client is requiring you to use maybe the client says you know I need you to use this particular type of technology if that does not work for your firm or maybe it prevents or, or it um, increases your likelihood of security breaches then it may not be reasonable but you need to consider those so now let's talk about, we've outlined all these different rules, right? There's the, there's the duty of confidentiality, the duty um, to communicate, the duty to supervise, and the duty of competency that specifically relates to technology. So how does this duty of reasonable care that we've outlined within a lot of these rules apply to the way that you use technology? So I'll let Matt kind of go through the different ways that this can apply and let's see this in action. Yeah, sounds great. So Emma just did a wonderful job of going over some of the specifics when it comes to uh, the rules. And so uh, what I want to talk about now is um, really how, you know, why the rules are important, how a lack of competency around technology can ultimately leave your law firm vulnerable, um, and talk through some specifics that you can do to ensure that things like that don't happen. Um, so as we know, you know, client information can be, you know, disclosed, lost, stolen, um, if we're not aware of the technology that we're using or, um, or the, the various precautions and the other things that we have um, in place. And so the first thing we want to talk about is uh, cloud computing. And so if you go back to that slide, I'm like, yeah, so um, so cloud computing is a great way for, um, for firms to um, be efficient, cost effective to really um, kind of propel them, uh, propel them ahead of the curve. And um, most firms will use some form of cloud computing and cloud applications like Tally, um, like Clio. You know, we've talked through the Florida Bar Ethics Opinion 12-3, uh, 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 which was adopted in 2003 and states that you know, attorneys are allowed to use cloud computing as long as they do proper research into the service providers, security protocols, um, and as long as ultimately you as the lawyer or the law firm still has um, ownership and access over, um, over that data. And so when it comes to diligence of your service providers, um, there's um, you know, a couple of different things that, that you can do. And I'm not gonna read, um, I'm not going to read all of this, but it does give you some good high level things to, um, to consider, um, to just make sure that you're doing everything you can to evaluate the service providers that, um, that you're, uh, that you're using to make sure that your again, your data secure, that it's protected against any hacks or potentially other preventable disclosures or, um, or data loss. And so some other important things to, uh, to consider, uh, when it comes to looking at your your service providers, um, so again, you know all these are um, are really important things um, to look at, such as the reputation and the location of uh, the provider that you're using, um, whether the you know the service agreement limits um, the service provider's liability. So ultimately, who's who's taking risk there? Um, and a handful of other things that just have to do with, again, access to data and your ability to own and access that data um, and where it ultimately um, rests um, as well. Um, so uh, a couple of other things that uh, we can go over here when it comes to diligence that you as an attorney leveraging technology can, can do and consider um, as you look at your cloud service providers. So we're going to walk through a couple of these things in more detail, um, specifically around 
vendor references, um, data security and encryption, terms of service, and access controls and user permissions. Um, and so uh, with vendor, um, or I guess let's first look at um, some secure cloud services examples. And I think actually, Emma, I'll let you um, just kind of run through um, run through this uh, this list as it relates to to Clio and and Tally. Sure. Thanks, Matt. Um, so I think that in general, before we get into these specific examples that we mentioned, I wanted to just kind of clarify, you can see within this slide, these are some examples to look through. And these are some things that Clio specifically does. And I know Tally does as well, uh, some of these things. So it's important to consider when you're using a cloud service provider, Matt will outline some more broad things to look at, but just wanted to give you some clear kind of examples here. So first of all, making sure like you're using different encryption methods. Uh, Clio specifically uses its 258-bit SSL encryption, right? We also have geo-redundancy so that your um, data is no longer stored in just one place in case of, you know, maybe um, environmental um, environmental problems. Maybe there's an earthquake. You don't want your information to store in one place specifically, as well as different user level permissions. Um, we'll go into that in more detail. And also having these like secure client portals. For instance, uh, Clio has uh, Clio Connect, which allows the clients to go in and do a more secure uh, kind of outside portal for communicating. So just wanted to outline those examples and uh, go back to Matt and talking about vendor references specifically. Yeah, and so um, so some of the things that you can consider in terms of vendor references as you evaluate essentially the reputation of the technology provider that you're looking at um, are a couple of different things, and and we've got some slides after this that'll walk through some specific examples. But essentially, you know, things to consider are bar association member benefits. For example, Tally and Clio are member benefits of the Florida Bar, along with a bunch of other bar associations as well. Um, legal technology consultants, essentially experts in the field of legal technology that are, you know, third parties. Um, so their job is just to evaluate technology and deliver um, recommendations to clients like solo and small firm attorneys. Uh, there's a bunch of legal specific publications out there as well, along with software review websites and other industry and technology um, surveys. And so if we look at, you know, bar association member benefits, like I said, you know, Tally and Clio are both uh, Florida bar member benefits. Clio um, has around 50 bar association uh, member benefit partnerships across, you know, the United States, Canada, and the UK. So highly vetted, you know, having to go through that approval process and ultimately deliver value, uh, delivers value to you as a lawyer, as a, as a Florida bar uh, member. Um, we mentioned legal specific publications as well. So you have tools like The Lawyerist out there that have um, a bunch of different reviews focused specifically on technology for attorneys, for lawyers. And so they're just one resource out of, out of many that you could leverage to, um, again, just get a lay of the land to understand what exists, what's out there and what other people think of certain technology. <laughs> um, their software review websites, Captera is one great example where they have a listing of a bunch of different um, practice management solutions, again, legal specific, along with a bunch of other solutions too, you know, timekeeping, um, other things like that. So Captera is another great resource. Um, there's also industry specific surveys. Um, the ABA has their legal technology survey report that they do. Um, and there's a bunch of others that you'll find out there. And again, all of these things you can access with a quick Google search. So I think um, that's really one of the big takeaways here is that, you know, two key resources for you are your local and state bar association as in terms of member benefits, look at who's already been vetted by your bar association to figure out where to go, where to look for technology. And then also just a Google search it can turn up all of this information, whether it's surveys or legal specific publications. Um, so a lot of information available really at your fingertips um, really quickly. Um, so the next thing uh, that I wanted to talk through was um, data security and encryption protocols. And I'm actually gonna hand this one off to Emma really quick, just to go over some of these high level things before I dive into some of the details that, that follow. 
Perfect. Thanks, Matt. So specifically, uh, when thinking about data security and encryption, there's a couple different uh, things to consider. Again, Matt will go into more specifics about these, but thinking about, again, like I mentioned, where your data is stored. So physical and environmental safeguards, like data storage, actual locations, um, geo-redundancy. You want to have your data stored in multiple different places, maybe not in just one place. And that is the benefit of the cloud in general, uh, as well as certificates. So you want to make sure you're using certified technology um, that, that has these certificates that you can view. Uh, and then there's data integrity measures like encryption, making sure you're using secure Wi-Fi, um, different security audits and testing that we'll go over in just a bit, um, as well as the, uh, having limitations on third-party access if that is the type of technology that maybe could have some third-party access there. And client security in general, precautions that you can use um, to safeguard your information for clients. So Matt will explain more about encryption and secure Wi-Fi now. Yeah, and so um, so in talking about encryption and secure Wi-Fi, I'm sure that um, everyone knows what SSL um, is and what it stands for, um, but probably not because uh, uh, it's uh, it can be technical. But so one of the important things um, when it comes to understanding encryption, leveraging web technology. Um, is SSL, which uh, SSL stands for Secure Sockets Layer. So in the event that you're ever in a trivia contest and that comes up, you now know the answer to that question. Um, but what it is, is more important. And it's basically an industry standard encryption technology that enables secure online banking and e-commerce. Um, so SSL will make sure that all of the communications that happen between your computer and the cloud-based server that you're leveraging, basically the, um, the application that you're leveraging through the web, is encrypted and protected from interception by a third party. Um, so it's a really you know, powerful technology that allows for completely secure communications. Um, and the important thing here is even over public, uh, public networks, so like public Wi-Fi if you're in a Starbucks or you know some other public place leveraging public Wi-Fi, ensuring that you're leveraging an SSL connection will make sure that you're protected even if you're leveraging that as your as your Wi-Fi source. Um, and while every web browser will use you know some variation of this lock um, that you see here on the slide um, to indicate that it's using an SSL connection, um, it will all look essentially the same. So that's how you will know that the website that you're using is safe and secure, again, regardless of the network that you may be on. Um, so just make sure that you look for that prior to, again, accessing or inputting any potential uh, confidential data um, on, that, on that website. Um, so server security, um, when it comes to kind of security audits and testing. So, you know, while SSL will help secure communications between your computer and the cloud, um, you also need to know that the servers that you're communicating with, basically the thing on the back end, um, is properly secured against as well. Um, and we'll, you know, it can be hard for uh, the average user to really assess um, you know, a cloud-based technology provider's server security. Um, there are things that you can make sure the technology provider is doing um, to make sure that those things are secure. Um, so, for example, you know, companies like McAfee uh, perform regular security audits on um, SaaS providers' uh, platforms to ensure server security. Um, that's one of the things that, that Clio, for example, does to make sure that their, uh, their application is secure. Um, and uh, one of the things that you can do as, a, as an end user is ask for evidence of this third-party security audit, um, you know, whether it's from McAfee or another provider. Um, before you ultimately entrust your data to that vendor or that cloud-based provider. Um, there's also a bunch of other like third-party monitoring tools and stuff out there. But again, this is one of those things when it comes to server security um, that you can ask um, the provider for specifically what they're doing um, and they should be able to deliver something to you. Um, and so this is one example of what a security audit uh, kind of certificate looks like and I'll just let Emma run through some of this as it relates specifically to Clio. Yeah, so so great point Matt. Um, you can ask 
any third party, you know, that you're thinking about using their technology, you should figure out what, what they're using to audit. Either it's internal or external. But here's a great example of uh, on Clio's website. You can go to this link that, that's, again, going to be included in these slides and see that they update um, that they have these different security audits run regularly. And you can see what they are specifically, what they're being used for, like McAfee, which Matt just uh, mentioned, uh, to check for, you know, any, any breaches, et cetera. And you can make sure they're up to date. In addition, we talked about certificates. So actually, if you click into any of these, you can view the certificates. Um, and here's just an example of what one would look like. I think whenever you're on a browser, um, you should again see that kind of secure um, icon there. And if you click on it, sometimes you can view the certificate directly from there as well. But this is an example of what a certificate would look like. And if there isn't one, that means it's probably not up to date. But you can see that this one was issued recently and it has all the check boxes marked. So that's something um, um, just kind of a quick check on your own that you can do to make sure things are secure. And Matt will talk again more about client security in particular. Yeah, and so, you know, we've talked a lot about um, cloud, cloud computing. Um, again, it's because it's what most applications um, are, are leveraging today. It's what Tally and it's what Clio do. Um, and it obviously has a huge number of advantages when it comes to actually outsourcing, you know, server level security and back up to third party service providers. Um, but one often overlooked part of the security equation is really the security of the actual um, desktop or laptop or device that you're using to access the application. Um, so if you do everything that we've talked about um, up to this point with SSL and all this other stuff, but the device that you're leveraging to access the platform is not secure, um, none of it matters. Um, and so, you know, by having all those things in place, it doesn't obviate the need for you to ensure that your device is properly secured with a firewall, with antivirus protection, and with the latest security updates for, you know, your operating system, your web browser, all the applications that run on that device. Um, so for Windows users, um, there's um, a thing called Google Pack, which offers free antivirus, um, anti-spyware um, software and Google's own web browser, Chrome um, as well. And then to ensure that your data um, is stored on your desktop or your laptop, so anything that you're storing locally um, rather than in the cloud uh, remains private, even if it is stolen, uh, you can look at installing, um, there's a couple of free encryption tools. So one is called uh, TrueCrypt. And it's a free tool that will encrypt the entire contents of your hard drive. So even if you have, say, some documents that have client information on them stored locally um, and that device, that laptop gets stolen, um, because you have the encryption uh, in place, um, that data will not be accessible. Um, the one thing with encryption, obviously, that you want to understand and make sure you never forget is, you know, there will be some sort of master password associated with that. Um, so make sure you never lose that. And then the other thing to consider with all this is just um, succession planning. Um, you know, so if there's ever anything that happens, right, where you're incapacitated or where you have to hand your practice off to someone else for any particular reason, um, just make sure in all of this that you're considering any of those things that could potentially happen. Uh, so you always do want some sort of backup or plan B. Um, so just make sure that you don't lose sight of that. Um, so the next thing uh, to mention is terms of service. So every technology provider out there should have a privacy policy um, that addresses confidentiality and ownership of, um, of data. Um, so in evaluating any cloud service provider, these are all the things that you should be able to look at um, and consider. And so when it comes to privacy policies, I think the main thing here is just making sure that they're clearly stated that they're not confusing and that they ultimately don't run to be like 300 and some pages long. Um, you know, you should be able to quickly glance at these things, look through them and get the information that you need. Um, and that's the, really the main thing to consider there is that they have one and that it's not overly complicated and that it's easy to understand. Um, the other piece that we mentioned that is again in, um, you know, a lot of the ethics opinions and the bar rules um, is around ownership and confidentiality of data. Um, so it's really critical to understand 
um, the impact of, you know, the privacy policy uh, for the technology that you're using on the ethical requirements that you have as a legal practitioner. Um, you know, one example around data ownership is, are you able to export your data at any time? Um, or when can that data be used by, if at all, by the provider that you're, that you're using? Um, you know, and uh, so these are all things to, to consider um, because ultimately the cloud service provider should only be permitted to view um, your private information that you're, uh, that you're hosting there with your explicit um, consent. For example, things like, you know, troubleshooting some sort of technical issue. Um, and so ownership of data though is key, making sure that you're able to, you know, export your data, that you're able to take it with you if you leave that provider and go somewhere else um, is one of the critical things to consider here. Um, and so with access control and user permissions, a um, bunch of other things to consider here, and I'm gonna let Emma dive into some of those. Thanks, Matt. Um, so we talked about kind of the fourth, the fourth bullet point here, which is access controls and user permissions, right? So this can mean a lot of different things. And you'll see outlined here, I've given some examples, but again, this is not all, in, all exclusive. This is not like your go-to guide, um, making your shirt, your, sure you're secure tongue twister there but making sure that you're secure these are not just like end all be all rules that you you can go through and check the box but these are things to consider again so things like user permissions and login tracking you want to make sure um, again that only the right people have access to the data that you can um, let that you can access who's who's reviewing this maybe you need to not give people access or maybe you need to discontinue their account etc what is the protocol for that? And then really important here is, again, we talked about, Matt just mentioned, ownership of data, right? And that can actually relate to being able to add and delete information and also being able to export your information when you leave. I think um, it's, it's amazing to me that sometimes, you know, for certain technology, you may not actually have access to the information. So if you um, want to cancel your subscription or something like that, you may not have the ability to export. And I think that is something really important as you're choosing providers to think through. Um, and I and I know both Tally and I think Clio um, provide, you know, easy access to the, to the data. It's not difficult. You're, you own that data yourself. So um, again, these are things to consider when you're, uh, when you're selecting selecting a technology to use for your firm or using a third party provider, um, as well as password protection and end user authentication. This is something so simple that we talked about earlier in terms of client security. That sounds easy, right? You're like, okay, I just need to set up a password. But these are small things that many people, even within your own firm, may not do. And again, you're not just only in charge of yourself, but you are um, required to, to look at these, um, to, to make sure you're abiding by your ethical duties. Um, in terms of the staff that you supervise as well and outside consultants. So for instance, in terms of user permission, I've just given kind of a screenshot here of <clears throat> different permissions that for instance, Clio can do. So you can make sure that, you know, different users only see certain types of things. So if you don't want someone to see your data reports, you can limit that permission. We also have login tracking where you can see specifically when someone logged in, just like when you, whenever you go into Google um, or your Gmail, I think you can see your logins there and see your IP addresses and you can discontinue computer. So that is something important uh, to be able to track as well if you have some sort of service that you're logging into to get access to it. And then password security in general. We already mentioned this, but I think it's really important to stress again because um, the, the funniest thing, I think people think about these data breaches and they're, they're really worried about third party companies exposing their information, right? But, but honestly, I think most of the data breaches that occur today are actually due to internal um, lack of safeguards. So really a small thing like setting up a more secure password, making sure that different passwords expire after a certain amount of time, or that, um, you know, your there is a password on your computer, just like you wouldn't leave your door unlocked to your office. Uh, for instance, when you leave, you wouldn't leave your laptop unlocked, right? So we need to think about it in the same way that we secure our data physically. Um, and, and 
to give you a couple examples here, uh, Clio actually has these different options that I think are, are great and something to consider um, in terms of also whenever uh, you have different softwares, making sure that you're staffed to something similar to this, but you can require passwords to be very lengthy, um, require a certain limit on them, and also make them expire after 30, 90 days, et cetera. So they have to be reset often. And you can also store your passwords in a third party um, like cloud provider service, such as LastPass, um, so that if somebody leaves, you know their login, but it's not just publicly available everywhere. And then things like two-factor authentication are important too. And you can do this on your Gmail, on your Outlook. You can do this um, within within Clio as well. But this gives you kind of like a different, uh, you know, a different option. You not only do you have to log in, but then you have to type in a code, either from an email provider or in this case, it's from um, a phone number that you've listed there. But it's just an extra layer of security so that somebody can can't log in to your account or maybe you use the same password for everything or maybe your employ employee does or person that you're outsourcing. This is a great way to protect that information and just add another layer of protection. So we're kind of going to finalize now with first of all a different security action plan. What can you do at your firm to safeguard this information and then how can technology help you in general and what, what should you consider going forward? So Matt can kind of uh, summarize with that. Yeah, and so, you know, we've talked through a lot of content um, here today, and I think the the main things is if you're, you know, if you're going to walk away, remember one thing, um, you know, remember this slide, which is, you know, a handful of things that you can actually do and implement starting today um, and going forward to make sure that you're doing everything you can to keep your your law firm and your, um, your data secure. Um, so first thing would be to create an encrypted backup of your computer's hard drive. Um, so if you're storing your firm's documents on a shared drive, um, just consider what your backup and encryption options are there as well. You know, we've walked through some free things that you can do. Um, there's other paid things that you can do. There's also things you can do with moving um, your documents to the cloud and leveraging a service provider to do that. Um, so that would be number one, create an encrypted backup of anything on your actual um, devices um, to make sure that it's all secure. Um, step two would be turning on two-factor authentication, like Emma just mentioned. Um, wherever you have it available, it's just an added layer of um, security um, that is there. Um, may seem annoying at first, but it's a good way to ensure that, again, things are secure. And the other thing is um, change all of your passwords to strong ones. Um, hopefully no one on this call has a, you know, a great password of one, two, three, four. Um, but if you do, please change that immediately. Um, and uh, wherever you can, um, just require you and your staff to use strong passwords um, as well. You know, the third thing is uh, find the access logs of your um, software service provider. So Emma walked through how you can do that on Clio, some of the different roles and permissions that you can, um, that you can allow there, and just uh, make sure that you know how people are accessing the software that you're using every day and make sure ultimately that they have the right level of access, right? If you have a staff member um, that, you know, for whatever reason has access to like a bunch of financial information, financial reports um, in your system, if they don't need access to that data to do their job, um, then don't give them access. Um, it, you know, it's that, it's that simple. Um, the fourth, you know, on a somewhat related note is just make a map of your current technology and the data that you have to make sure that you know what you're using it for um, and what the purpose is. Um, you know, it's super important to understand that those things line up. And the last is just understand, you know, the data privacy laws that apply to your specific practice area, right? If you're in healthcare, you have HIPAA. Um, if you're elsewhere, you have high tech, you know, all the rules that create special standards um, just make sure that you understand all of those as well. Um, and, you know, we've talked a lot about, um, you know, potentially the dangers of technology. I think the main thing to point out is that technology is there to help, right? It's there to help you streamline your intake process. It's there to help you increase your efficiency and productivity to make sure that you're communicating this in a secure um, way that allows you to collaborate with your client in a way that lets you do more client focused work rather than administrative work, right? And easily collect payments. Um, you know, it's there to make your life 
easier, not more difficult. And, you know, just one example um, of, you know, how the latest technology is impacting your practice is with tools like Tally, with tools, you know, like Clio, where you can, um, you know, literally use your Amazon Echo device to create a time entry that you can then sync directly to a practice management system like Clio, right? Things that eliminate clicks, things that eliminate screens, things that eliminate administrative process, you know, that's the power of technology, right? Um, you know, all of these things, whatever we do with any piece of technology, whether it's in our professional or our, or our um, personal lives, there's always an element of risk there. Um, but the main thing to do is understand these rules, understand the things that you can do to make sure that the value that you're getting from the technology um, far outweighs any risk that you're taking and that, you know, you're doing diligence to make sure that those risks are as minimal as possible. Um, and so with that, we'll open it up to, uh, to Q&A. And I think, um, you know, we've got a contact us slide at the end here as well. But if there are any questions, go ahead, either send them in now, or if we've got, you know, a backlog um, at all, we can identify those. Um, and we've got also a course number here that we can share with you all, um, which is 3239. Um, so that's the course number for this. And then let's just see if there are any questions that we have out there in the queue. Yeah, it looks like, so uh, Paul, uh, Paul and someone else have just submitted um, questions and thanks to our tally and Cleo help desk as we were speaking again it's a little difficult for Matt and I to watch these uh, questions as they come in but it looks like they were already answered one was in regards to um, opposing counsel using free email and again that just the, the standard of using email and whether you need to discuss it with your client and whether you need to encrypt it etc depends on like, there is no firm and fast rule here right you need to consider what type of information you're sending um, and also uh, you know, what type of data, how does a how can a client communicate? What's the likelihood that if you don't use a certain tool, you will get hacked? Um, what's the cost of it to you? So again, like, even if you're not certain that maybe this is, you know, maybe you don't necessarily need to use some super high encryption, but a nice safeguard and something to safeguard yourself may actually be in order, uh, maybe something like making sure that you're using you might just want to, since the cost of services is going down, it might only cost you something like five, ten dollars a month to use some more secure uh, portal for communication. And it, it, uh, I think our Italian help desk gave a great example of one way that Clio uh, provides more secure communication in general through so that Clio Connect portal, which actually encrypts the data directly, and the client has to log in to get those documents. So it obviously you don't need to send it for every type of communication if it's not super confidential. But when you're sending over for documents, something such as that where it encrypts the information for you can definitely be worthwhile to consider. Um, and then, yeah, we just got a question about PowerPoint slides. Yes, the PowerPoint slides will be emailed. We'll also be emailing this course code just to um, uh, just make sure that everyone knows it. Um, as well as don't don't hesitate to contact either Matt or I or um, those are you know the different things that you can tweet related to our companies. But you can definitely contact us for any further questions as well. And awesome, thank you guys for, for your great feedback. And uh, we'll, we'll stay on here in case any other questions come through. Um, but if not, have a great day and we'll, we'll stay on here um, for a couple more minutes, I think Matt and I, uh, in case anything else comes in. Yeah, thank you all, have a good one. Like Emma said, keep an eye out for information uh, via email from us, slides, recording, course number, and then um, you will know how to get um, in touch with us um, in any way that you need there. But otherwise, thank you all for joining. Um, have a great rest of your rest of your day and rest of your week and uh, take care.